So welcome to Europe's Prepare and Present, a poster presentation. My name's Jerry McMillan, I'm a Europe advisor, and if you could scan the QR code on the sheet in the back, we could get you checked in, that would be great. And today we are going to talk about our upcoming symposium poster session. We're going to talk about how to design a poster, what sort of things to consider, what sort of what do you want to put on it? What do you not want to put on it? All of those sorts of things that go into actually building a poster. Then we'll spend some time talking about presenting a poster. If you would scan the QR code at the back, that would be great. We'll talk about, during the poster session, there's a poster. There's you. How do the two work together? And then after that's done, we're going to spend some time, as you can see, I've brought visual aids. What we're going to do is we're going to take a couple of minutes. I'm going to invite all of you to take a look at them, and then we'll just talk about them. What do we like? What do we not like? The one thing we will learn going through that, there is no such thing as a perfect poster. You don't want to recreate anything that's here, but you'll get ideas. What do you like? What, are, what don't you like? So that's what we're going to talk about today. But let's start with a very basic question. What's a poster? For our purposes, a poster is a three foot by four foot piece of stuff. On that stuff is a summary of your project. The whole point of the poster is it's a distillation of what's important in the research you've done. There is a significant issue with poster design. It's only this big. Any research project is much bigger than that. So as we start talking about poster design, start thinking about the fact that you can't put the whole thing there. A poster is not a research paper. I've seen posters that try to be a research paper. It doesn't work. So one of the major factors is you got this much space. How are you going to fit what you need to on there? As I mentioned, a poster is not a complete presentation. And there are two reasons for that. First of all, as I mentioned, space. You can't get it all there. But the other thing about a poster presentation is the poster is half of the presentation. What's the other half? You. The poster is half of it. You talk about the poster. Together, you're the presentation. So as we think about this, what's the purpose of a poster and of a poster presentation? The first of all, it's to capture interest. As I was saying a little while ago, each of our poster sessions, morning and afternoon, are probably going to have close to 250 posters. People are going to be walking the aisles of this very chaotic, very crowded building. Why do they want to stop at your poster? What do you have on your poster that makes them go, hmm, oh, why do they want to stop and look at yours? So posters capture interest. The second thing they do is they communicate about your project. What is, it, what is it that you want to share with your audience? Your poster, as you look at it, should tell them something about your project. And then the third thing the poster does is it gives people an, an interest in learning more. As we said, it's not going to have everything. But a really good poster, a really good presentation of the poster, is going to have people asking questions. It's not going to have it all. How can you provide more information that's here? Be ready for that. So here comes the major issue as you're preparing a poster. What do you put on a poster? We just talked about the goals of your poster. When you're designing a poster, as you're looking at it, you only have this limited space. You think, I want to put this. 
Ask yourself, does this get, in, get me closer to achieving those three goals? And if the answer is no, consider leaving it out. It's really easy to put too much on a poster. Because the reflex is, I want to tell everything about my project. That's a mistake. So a really important question to ask yourself is not what should I put on my poster, but what should I not put on my poster. And here's where I put my standard disclaimer. I have some very strong ideas about poster design. They're based on a whole lot of reasons, a whole lot of experience looking at posters, working with posters, and they are not always wide, always universally accepted. And so as my disclaimer, I will probably say, or I may say something that disagrees with advice you are getting from your faculty mentor. If what you hear from me disagrees with your faculty mentor, they are by definition correct, even if they are wrong. Simply because you have to live with them, you never have to see me again. That said, I will try to explain the reasons for things that I say. If you like my reasonings, argue with your faculty mentor, but go with them anyway. So any ideas, given we've got this three foot by four foot thing, what would you consider leaving off of your poster? References take up a lot of space, and nobody reads them. <laughs> and a lot of people think it's critical to, in print, acknowledge the sources you're using for your research. And I absolutely agree with that statement, except for two words, in print. Because one of these has a reference section. No, maybe I didn't bring that one. Oh yeah, here we go. For me, that's wasted space. Nobody's going to use it. All it's doing is filling a purpose that people think you need to fill. Couple of things. First of all, it is absolutely critical to acknowledge support you have gotten for your research. If you're using somebody's diagrams, if you're building on somebody else's research, you need to acknowledge that. So the question isn't whether you should. The question is how to do it. The easiest way is leave it off, and as you're talking to people, say, and I'm building on the work of these professors. If you want more information, I can tell you about them. Something I've seen people do is tape a 9 by 13 envelope on the back of the poster, print out the references, and say, if you want my references, I got it. Or hang it from your poster here. But don't take up valuable poster space with your method, or with your references. So yes, references I would leave off. Any other suggestions? I've got two more. For me, and this is the one that's the most controversial, is I would never put an abstract on a poster. I know if you are doing BioSci Excellence in Research, they require you to put an abstract on a poster. If you're doing that and talking to them, ask them why. Because if you recall what we said when we said, what is a poster? The answer is a summary of your research. What's an abstract? A summary of your research. So to me, putting a summary of research on a summary of your research is not only redundant, as you will talk about later when we're looking at the specific posters, you put a giant block of text on there, people aren't going to look at it. People aren't going to be drawn to it. They're not going to spend the time to read it. So if you have the option of not putting your abstract on your poster, don't put the abstract on your poster. 
The third thing I suggest, leaving off or significantly abbreviating, abbreviating on a poster, is your methods. And the biggest reason I say this is particularly for most science papers, the methods are so incredibly long and detailed that they resist summarization. It's hard to take that 37-step process and put it down to three bullet points. So maybe put two bullet points of, we did it. These were the kind of ways we did it. I'll tell you more if you ask. But having a complete method section on a poster is really difficult to pull off. So definitely consider shortening that or eliminating altogether with in mind, again, the poster is not the entire presentation. If somebody wants to know about your methods, they'll ask, you tell them. So think about what you don't need to put on your poster. And then you'll start thinking about what you need. And there are some things you definitely want. First of all, tell them why you did your project. What is the hole in the body of human knowledge you were trying to fill, and why is it important to do that? Maybe a statement or two about what's happened in your field so far. That's not critical. But something to set the scene of why you did what you did. And then something that talks about what you found out. And sometimes even results defy summarization. So maybe a couple of quick points, because the most important thing on your poster is what does it mean? Now that you've done this, why does it matter? Why should the people walking by care? Think about the goals of the poster. Ask yourself, am I fulfilling these goals? Everything on the poster should contribute to that goal, to that message. Another thing that's really important on a poster is blank space. And this is something a lot of people don't think of. They think, I've got four foot by three foot. I can jam all this stuff on. At which point it becomes really confusing trying to find the borders between this block of information, this one, and this one, and this one. And all of a sudden, people are suffering from eye fatigue just walking by. So as you're planning the poster, resist the urge to fill every square millimeter with stuff. Make it clear that this is on a canvas, but leave some canvas behind it. As you're designing the poster, even though you are part of that presentation, you want people to understand at least what they're looking at. They may not understand the content, but you want them to be, under, be able to understand what they're looking at, how they should read it, how it's built. First of all, think about headings. If you are working in a STEM field, you are probably used to these headings. Introduction, methods and materials, results, discussion. I have a suggestion. Don't put any of those on your poster. And the reason is, well, two reasons. First of all, if I look at your poster and say, oh, you have results. What have I just learned that's different from these 17 that also have results? The headings are in big print. Those are the things people are going to see. So instead of just having big type that says results, have big type that says we cured cancer. Or, OK, if you did, please put that in big type. Um, but have your results say, or have your headings say something. Don't just use the stock headings everybody else is having. If you're doing, instead of, say, introduction, Babies are dying in the U.S. Okay, now you know what this is about. Now we know what problem you're trying to solve. Instead of a discussion, 
this will decrease infant mortality. Okay, now I'm going to want to look rather than just seeing, okay, results, cool, fine. So think about using headings that have actual information in them. Think about organization. We got a big splotch of stuff here. Most people are going to read top to bottom, left to right. It's a really good idea to keep your information that direction. But something else I think is really a good idea that a lot of people don't do, number your headings. If your headings are not the standard research paper headings that everybody knows, okay, I read this one, this one, this. If they have different text on them, just put a one, two, then people know exactly where to go. Give an organization that makes sense so that people can start, follow it through. I've seen some very de well-designed posters that have an introduction top center and then have two different paths. But they're designed well enough that as you look at it, it's not confusing. But whatever gets people to follow the narration you're trying to present, do that. Illustrations are fantastic. Graphs are fantastic. And they're often badly used in posters. Make sure your illustrations mean something. There, you will see a lot of posters. You'll also see this in oral presentations. A lot of pictures, because they're pretty or cool, and are just taking up space without contributing anything other than something pretty and cool. Use illustrations that work towards those purposes. If you're using graphs, label all of your axes. Label all of your data points and leave out anything that doesn't contribute. Unfortunately, the standard Excel charts that so many people use put way too much information in there. Think about this just as an example. You've got a y-axis that goes from 0 to 100. All of your data points are between 60 and 80. Why do you have all of those other labels on it? Put only what's in, what's, what helps with the information. Think about things like uh, 3D bar graphs, shaded things, all of that. They decrease from readability. You want it to be as clear, concise, and readable as possible. Label everything. One thing that a lot of people do, and I know I've got examples up here. Okay, I didn't bring that one. One thing a lot of people do is they number figures on a poster. I strongly recommend you do not do this. The reason to number a figure in a research paper is you can say things like, as you can see in figure 12 on page 37, well, we only have one page. Your caption is probably right under the figure. You don't have text that says, see that figure, it's just sitting there. So don't number your figures, it's extra space. But do have a very clear caption. Another thing, you want to be able to read your poster from a distance. You want to at least be able to read your, your title from minimum six feet. And when I say you, I am not just talking about your very young eyes, I am talking about my very old eyes. You want me to be able to read your poster from a distance. One of the things about the symposium poster session, we've never done it in the Bren Center before, but I anticipate our poster session to have the three flaws we have had in every poster session I've been involved with. Every year we ask for feedback, and we always get three things about the poster session, too hot, too crowded, too noisy. The too crowded means people aren't going to be able to walk up to your poster and admire it at close distance. You want people to walk by and, oh, what's that about? Then they can approach you and ask for more questions. But make sure everything's big. You want people to read it. The other thing, when you are thinking about readable from a distance, as you are thinking about what text to put on your poster, 
I strongly encourage you to avoid paragraphs. I also strongly encourage you to avoid sentences. I am a big fan of four to five word bullet points. Maybe you need, a, maybe you need nine or ten words in a bullet point. But the longer the block of text is, A, it takes up more space, B, the less likely it is people are going to read it. Going back to the why I don't like abstracts on posters. Make your text readable, and part of that is having less text. So as you are writing your text, go back to those goals for your poster. Does this entire sentence need to be here? Can I abbreviate it to four words? How can you shorten things is an important consideration. Avoid visual distractions. I already talked about um, images that don't serve any purpose. Think about different fonts. Think about different colors. It's great to have a color contrast if it means something. As a note, the most common form of color blindness in humans is red-green. So avoid those as your contrasts. But if you have one basic color and then something a different color to emphasize things, great. But don't just say, I got 18,000 colors on my computer and I'm going to use all of them. Make them mean something. Same thing with typefaces and fonts. As a note, particularly from a distance, italic type is harder to read than non-italic type. So I would avoid it. For a poster, I would also stick with, to get more technical, sans serif fonts. If you're not sure what that is, serifs are those little doohickeys that hang off of letters in some fonts like Times Roman. This is a sans serif font. It is just clean, easier to read from a distance. I don't think I, there's some sans serif up here I can show you later. But you want it to be as clean as possible. You want to avoid distractions as people look at your poster. And as we move towards the symposium, there are two dates I want you to keep, or two things I want you to keep in mind for your poster sessions. First of all, the first week in May, in this place we are going to have two sessions of interactive poster workshops. What those are is, as you'll notice, there are a lot of screens in these Wherever you are in your poster process, bring it in. Bring it on your laptop. Bring it on a, on a USB stick. We'll find some way to display it. Anybody in the room can then walk by and say, oh, I like that. Or have you considered? I'll be here. We may have more Europe staff. But it's a way to get feedback on your design before you actually go out and print it. So I recommend those highly. The other date that's important is May 8. Sometime next week, I do not know the exact date, we are going to send parts of your applications back to you. We're going to ask you, give you the opportunity to update your information. If you want to change your abstract, change your title, some other things, you can do it during that period. The two things that will be new for that deadline is you'll need to upload your poster to our website or to the application for our website. And we will ask you if you want your poster to be judged during the symposium. During the symposium, we will have teams of judges wandering the floor evaluating posters that have been asked to be judged. And we will, if you'll remember when you submitted your form, we had a list of 11 themes we will be giving awards to three student or three poster presentations in each of those themes. These are the Chancellor's Awards for Excellence in Undergraduate Research, which means you get a certificate signed by the Chancellor, which is pretty cool. One student or one presentation in each of those themes will also receive an Amazon gift card. So um, if you want your poster to be judged at the symposium, you will also need to choose that before the May 8th deadline. Some of you may be thinking, May 8th, but the symposium's on the 19th. I'm not going to have it ready by then. 
Which brings me to another point. In talking to local print shops, particularly the two on campus, but others, the symposium is an enormous event. There are a lot of posters. The print shops we've talked to want a two-week lead time to print posters. May 8 is keeping right in that timeline. So we're assuming you're going to have it done by then anyway. So those are the important things between now and then. And at this point, I'm going to take a brief break. We've now talked through the poster design process. We'll talk about how to present your poster in a minute, and then we'll also take a look at, at these posters and talk about them, evaluate them amongst ourselves. But any questions on the actual design process? Either I covered it perfectly or I've just stunned you with too much information. <laughs> then let's move on. Yeah, go ahead. What software would I, should I recommend? Would I recommend to design? The answer is, I always have to say this. If you've ever been to any of my pres any of my workshops, the answer to almost everything is it depends. This is an it depends. Partially, it depends on use what you're comfortable with. A lot of people use PowerPoint simply because it's really easy to build a rectangular thing in PowerPoint. Uh, because it's built for that sort of thing. I'm not a fan because PowerPoint is somewhat lacking in the precision department. I'd use Illustrator, but I have Illustrator. So use what you have, use what you're comfortable with, but PowerPoint is probably the one that's used the most. <laughs> 